Uh, okay, hello everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks a lot for the organizers internationally and locally, and in particular to Dennis Rätsel for the organization. This is my first time at uh, RQI, and I followed some of the online talks. They're very interesting, and I'm happy to be able to give a talk here. So the topic is gravity as free fall in graded geometry. The picture shows Earth free falling in the gravitational potential of the moon and the sun, of course. The research that I'm going to talk about is the side product of research on trying to find effective gravity actions in string theory. There's a lot of mathematics involved, but there were some side uh, products, and I'm going to talk about these. If I get to the second slide. Okay. So I'm from Constructor University. Uh, the name is quite new. We recently changed from Jacobs University, so in case people don't know that yet. Um, it's a small private research university in the north of Germany. It's about 15 kilometers from here to the north. A nice green campus, as you can see on the picture. We used to be called International University Bremen, then after like six or seven years changed into Jacobs University Bremen to honor Klaus Jacobs, who was very generous in funding us, and more recently we changed into Constructor University. There's about 1,800 students, uh, one quarter of which are PhD students. We're always happy for new students and researchers coming to our place. There's 120 nations on campus, and the language on campus is English. And we are a private university. I have no idea how this Zeit, uh, Wissenschafts Zeitarbeitsgesetz applies to us. Okay, topic is uh, free falling. We have the universal, universality of gravity. We have a beautiful purely geometric description of gravity as free fall in curved space time. So, in a way, gravity is a pseudo force. It's not a real force from this point of view. So, I'll try to extend this to other forces. It will require going from a geometric description to an algebraic description. And as a side product, it will make the whole thing more accessible to quantum theory, which maybe is interesting in this context of the conference here. Okay, we have seen, been some uh, great past ideas on the geometric unification of gravity with other forces, most notably Kaluza-Klein, extra dimensions, compactifications, which leads to a nice unification of gravity and electromagnetism, can also be extended to other forces. It also has uh, well-known problems, in particular this infinite tower of massive states, uh, but it also has interesting applications, in particular in string theory. Another thing that, one, that was studied in particular by Einstein was to introduce a non-symmetric part of the uh, metric tensor, look at non-symmetric gravity. The original idea was to interpret the non-symmetric part as an electromagnetic field. This failed. This has come up again in string theory, where this is the Karl Ramon field, and it appears exactly in this combination. Vice versa, one could give up on this whole program, and describe gravity as an ordinary force, like it's done in tele parallel equivalent general relativity with Weizenberg connection, torsion, etc., when gravity is nothing so special anymore. It's just like an ordinary force. We shall do something else. We shall consider a more algebraic quantum mechanics motivated approach, because I really like quantum mechanics. Um, that's a picture of our theories as a deformation of classical mechanics with uh, gravity and general relativity on the left-hand side and quantum theory on the right-hand side. The language on the left-hand side is differential geometry. Geometric description, the language on the right-hand side is algebra, algebra of operators, representations on Hilbert spaces, etc. The holy grail is on the top. We don't know much about it, but we can speculate about the right language about it. Should be something that combines geometry with algebra, some kind of non-commutative geometry, generalized geometry, quantum geometry, or created geometry. Another idea to get from here is to use some of this mathematical language to also describe the left-hand side, have a more algebraic description of things that actually already work quite well with ordinary geometry. OK, to make this more concrete, slightly more concrete, uh, geometry versus algebra, uh, from a point of view of quantum field theory. So I will do exactly the opposite of what Klaus just said on his slides. We look at the universality of light cones and how, how do they work in quantum field theory? Well, if you have uh, 
local quantum operators which are space-like to each other when they commute. If they're not space-like to each other, then they will not commute, and this will give you exactly the light cone. So it's an algebraic, an algebraic description of, um, of light, of light cone. Um, if you go to ordinary quantum mechanics, from this point of view, you get the canonical commutation relations. And the idea that we want to follow is to deform these commutation relations to introduce interactions. So one of, on one of the last slides, Klaus had this idea of deforming the commutation relations and get some crazy new non-local physics. Actually, it's not so crazy, it just introduces forces like the electromagnetic force. We will then, I will show you how this works in electromagnetism, and we will then see how to adapt it to also include gravity. For gravity, we will need to introduce fermionic va variables. We need to look at some kind of a graded geometry. So this is going to be an algebraic alternative to free fall, to minimal coupling, covariant derivatives, and gauge theory, but very closely related. So here's the idea. Gravity equals free fall in curved space-time. Let's extend this idea to all the forces, not just gravity, but not using kaluza klein instead of using algebra, uh, algebra. So the rules of the game will be to use free Hamiltonians for everything, free fall, and introduce the interactions by the deformation of a quantum algebra. Classically, we deform symplectic structure. Quantum mechanically, we would deform the quantum algebra. Ordinary gauge theory and the ideas of general relativity are then re, uh, recovered via Moser's lemma. I will not go into too much details here, I'll just mention it. The deforming maps that deform the algebras and the symplectic structures were not unique, and this non-uniqueness takes the place of gauge symmetries, and actually very precisely. It's not just words, it's also formulas. It's more general than gauge symmetry. I will show you the example of electromagnetism. You can, for instance, also describe a magnetic sources, which would not be possible in ordinary gauge theory. Okay, so I'll start with the electromagnetic example, then we'll go see how it works in gravity. So following the rules of the game, we start with a free Hamiltonian. And then you can do two things. Firstly, what you usually do, you deform the Hamiltonian, you do minimal coupling, introduce um, a gauge potential that shifts momentum, and you keep going. It's because Cook recipe, we're so used to it so that we don't think about it anymore. Uh, but I want to argue you can do something else. You can take the canonical symplectic structure and deform that thing instead and leave the Hamiltonian like it was. And, well, it will give you exactly the same thing in the end. Okay, to be concrete, this is a relativistic conference, so let's look at a relativistic particle. I like, it, like the action in the Einbein formalism, so, we, that, so that we don't have square roots. Here's the action that we're looking at, the La, Lagrangian action. The metric, um, an Einbein down here, for a massive particle coupling to an electromagnetic field. When you see this, I think your reflexes kick in, you do what you learned in high school or maybe beginning university. You compute the canonical momentum, you do the Chandra transformation and end up with the Hamiltonian action. But let's, let's not do this. Let's don't let the reflexes take you over. Just do the Lachanta transformation, but let that term stay put. Don't touch it. And the Hamiltonian action will look as follows. And what has changed is symplectic potential, this very first term, but in the end will turn into the symplectic two form. Okay, so P is here P plus A, that's dx, that's the deformed symplectic two form. The corresponding Poisson brackets will be deformed. The P's don't come. My pointer is lost. Oh, can I use this one? Yeah, I can also use I need to go back. Okay, we jumped a little bit ahead. Sorry about this. Um, the, the Poisson packet of a momentum, momentum don't commute anymore, but we are governed by the electromagnetic field. Tensor, the other Poisson packets stay the same. Um, oops. Okay, yeah, cool. If you look, uh, if you compute the Jacobi identity, you will find it uh, depends on the divergence of a magnetic field, essentially. 
So whenever you don't have any magnetic sources, Jacobi identity will be satisfied. But if you do have magnetic sources, then the Jacobi identity of a Poisson bracket would break. You can use the free Hamiltonian. It's quadratic in P squared, even in the relativistic case, because I'm using the Einbein formalism. Together with the deformed Poisson bracket, compute the um, equations of motion, where well, you find the usual thing. I said mass equal to 1, so velocity is equal to momentum. And the derivative of momentum gives you exactly the relativistic way of writing down the um, Lorentz, Hamilton Lorentz equations, the Lorentz force. So here the force doesn't come from Hamiltonian, because, but it comes from the deformation of the Poisson brackets. Um, this can be easily quantized with path integral methods, deformation quantization, or in fact, because it's so simple here, canonically. So you get like what we had with Poisson brackets before, you get the deformed commutation relations. Um, a natural way of writing down the Hamiltonians in terms of gamma matrices, and in this way, it's still free, it's not coupled to anything. In this way, you get automatically correct coupling to spin. And the Heisenbergs of motion give you the correct um, Lorentz Heisenberg e equations of motion for a charged particle in an electromagnetic field. Okay, so that's the idea. We introduce interactions by the deformation. Um, if you look at the associativity of the operators involved, you see that it's satisfied as long as you don't have magnetic sources, but it can be broken by magnetic sources. You can look at finite translations, and when Chakif quite a while ago in 85, and then again in uh, 2002, has shown that you get global non-associativity unless the Dirac quantization condition is satisfied. So that's another way of understanding the Dirac quantization condition. Incidentally, it's hard to formulate quantum mechanics when you have a non-associative observable algebra. It's not the topic of this talk, but we just published a paper on it, so if you're interested, you can ask me in the coffee break. Okay, so, so much about electromagnetism. Let's try to do the same thing for gravity, free fall in graded geometry, which was the title of this, this talk. We'll do very pedestrian, we will try to derive stuff, so not going to throw some fancy mathematics like Courant algebraids or PQ manifolds at you, we'll do it step by step. Uh, we do it very naively also. So we want to use the metric field that governs gravity. We want to use that to deform Poisson packets and eventually canonical commutation relations. There's an immediate problem, of course, this thing is symmetric, and commutators are anti-symmetric. So we will need to introduce odd variables in order to have symmetric uh, Poisson packets and commutators. So we make an ansatz here. We introduce some new variables. They will turn out to be Grassmannian compute the Poisson packet, we want to deform it by the metric field. We don't want to touch the PX commutation relations like before for electromagnetism, because we're also not touched. P is just acting like a derivative on coordinates and also like a derivative on functions. So we're not going to touch this, we just change this around. Now we can do some uh, little detective work based on associativity and grading and try to figure out what the objects are. Uh, for coordinates and functions of the coordinates, we introduce a degree zero, which should be just bosonic. You should be able to take arbitrary functions and powers. The fetus, they can have a different degree. Well, I don't want to go through all the steps, but it follows automatically. You will find that the fetus should have degree one, which should be odd. And the Poisson packet should have degree minus two to compensate for this. And then this whole thing starts to make sense. Um, the grading that I use is integer. So I'm not using fermionic grading. So one will be odd, not one half will be odd. It's just multiplied by two. Here's again what we get. So we, def we deform with new Grassmannian variables with a metric, and what we end up is called an NP supermanifold. It's, uh, okay, quite technical. It's the tangent uh, bundle shifted in degree by one, and of this thing, uh, a bit nice sum with a cotangent bundle shifted the degree by two, but never mind. <laughs> it's just technical. Momenta have degree two. And if you ever wondered why you don't have functions of momentum, but just p squared, that's one of the explanations for it, because it's graded, it's not degree zero. Okay, but this is not complete yet. We can try to complete the Poisson algebra here. Uh, try to figure out what should be Poisson brackets of p with theta for instance, and it turns out that everything is exactly fixed just by grading and by associativity, there's no freedom anymore. P has degree two, P 
theta has degree 1, bracket has degree minus 2, so we should get something that's linear and with thetas of degree 1 times some coefficients. We work out the properties from associativity, it turns out to be a connection automatically. Um, you can compute some Jacobi identities for P with theta and theta, which is just the Jacobi identity written here, and interpret it of, in terms of things that we have written down. That's the derivative of the metric here. We got connection twice. So we find that we actually have a metric connection, metric with respect to a metric that we used to deform the Poisson brackets. So the only thing that entered was associativity here. You keep going like this. Uh, in the Poisson packet of a momentum, you find the curvature tensor, and so on. You can complete the whole story. So we got this uh, graded, deformed Poisson structure deformed by the metric. We automatically got connections, um, curvature, and there's also some torsion hidden in it. But it's a Poisson algebra. We can ask about the symmetries. So we should look at canonical transformations and the generators of infinitesimal canonical transformations. The Poisson bracket is degree minus 2, so the generators of degree 2 will be degree preserving. And that's the most general thing that you can write down. Uh, the first term gives you infinitesimal um, coordinate transformations, this gives you diffeomorphisms, and the second term gives you, point, gives you Lorentz transformations, local Lorentz transformations, so it's automatic, Lorentz symmetry is built in. Generators of degree 1, we form a Clifford algebra. Generators of degree 3, so it's one of the Grassmann variables times a momentum, they look like a Dirac operator. You could also deform them by a free flux. And generators of degree 4, they're a bit messy. There can be two momenta of degree 2. There can be two thetas of degree 1 with one momentum, or there can be four thetas. So that's the most general thing that you could write down if you pretend that the coefficients are arbitrary. Now, if the coefficients are what the letters suggest, like a metric, a connection, and the Riemann tensor, then actually we swing close into a supersymmetry algebra. So the Dirac operator closes into this generator of degree 4 that plays the role of a Hamiltonian. So again, this was all automatic. Let's look at dynamics. Um, we want something very dramatic in momentum. Dynamics should be generated by the Dirac operator. I do a little bit of a leap of faith here. You know the Dirac equation, you know how the square of it gives you the Klein-Gordon equation. We try something similar. So we say dA by d tau. Time derivative of some classical observable should be given by the double application of the Dirac operator. You do a little bit of algebra. It turns out to be the Poisson bracket of a Hamiltonian that I showed you with the observable, and that's the kind of complicated Hamiltonian here. For torsionless connection or for particles without spin, only the quadratic part is here, so it's just a free Hamiltonian. Uh, let's check out what this does. Compute um, the four velocity and then the derivative of the four momentum. That's again straightforward from the formulas. And um, well, what type of connection to use should be any metric compatible connection? We can pick Weizenberg. What, ends, what we end up getting in the end is uh, the geodesic equation. So this idea works. We have uh, this graded Poisson structure, you deform it by the metric, use the free Hamiltonian, and you end up getting interactions that just, just look like what you should get in gravity. So you have free fall in graded geometry here. Uh, if, well, if you drop non associativity, has drastic consequences. It will need non-metricity of a connection and also to gravito magnetic sources and possibly mass quantization. We don't want to do this here. How about quantizing it? So the idea is we want some relativistic system and we want to study quantum mechanics in it. Uh, low energy quantum mechanics, I guess, in this context here. This is ideally suited to it. Um, we can go from the Poisson structure to the quantum structure, so we get canonical commutation relations. Grassmann variables become gamma matrices. The, um, the product of them are anti-symmetric, which you get an anti-commutator of gamma, uh, gamma matrices, so commutator of gamma matrices, so we get Lorentz generation generators, and the anti-commutator gives you a Clifford algebra. Um, Right, so let's have a little dictionary here between the geometric 
way of doing it, like everybody does it, and the algebraic thing, concepts of metric connection and curvature in ordinary geometry become, all of them become deformations of Poisson structures. We deform a little thing and the rest comes out. Metricity becomes associativity. Symmetries are implemented by canonical transformations and after quantization, unitary transformations. A Poincaré symmetry are three minutes, are degrees preserving transformations, inertial coordinates, are taboo charts, etc. We have got this whole dictionary here. Okay, I should have a little disclaimer here. This was just a toy model. It was the simplest possible model you could write down. Uh, there are other deformations. There are more realistic deformations, usually with double the odd um, sector. It could be fixed by world line supersymmetry. And this is all valid at low energies below the pair production uh, threshold at higher energies. You should use Q of T's, but I guess in the context of what we want to do here, low energies are fine. Uh, some motivations, applications. Well, I said that a couple of times. I think it's a convenient setting for doing relativistic quantum information applications. It's real, it could lead to real, real, realistic models of quantum bits. Um, the idea is to be able to transfer ideas from gauge theory to gravitational physics. And the thing that I really wanted to look at originally was geometric phase effects. But when I came about something different that I want to show here before closing, this actually this whole thing suggests a new approach to a quantum equivalence principle. Okay, that's a quick overview of uh, what we've discussed so far. Classical mechanics, if you go to non-inertial reference frame, you get pseudo-forces, uh, Coriolis, centrifugal force. Gravity is interpreted as a pseudo-force. In a phase-based setting, this corresponds to deformations of Poisson structures, like I, like I tried to argue. In the quantum setting, it would uh, correspond to deformations of a quantum algebra. Now we put all these ideas together, and... Um, I have the following proposal that I'm happy to discuss of a quantum equivalence principle motivated by the analogy from geometry to uh, quantum physics. A curved framed space-time corresponds to a deformed graded quantum algebra. And these feet are such as like field binds. And then I would say the effect of a gravitational background on a local quantum system is equivalent to a universal deformation of the underlying extended quantum algebra. So local means point test particles, local quantum fields, so that we don't get tidal effects. Universal is the main point. The deformation should be independent of mass or other intrinsic properties. Extended, well, we, need, we may need to extend the algebra by a graded component in order to couple to gravitational fields. Strong version would, when replace quantum systems by a quantum gravitational system, but the rest would be the same. So that's my proposal. I'm al almost out of time. Can I go through some of the remarks? Okay. Some remarks. So it's a formulation purely in quantum terms, which we want. There's no free-falling laboratories or something like this. It's com automatically compatible with quantum mechanics. Um, would predict that superposition, tangent, everything completely stays intact. It's not modified at all. Focus on the quantum algebra instead of states, but this can be translated in quantum field theory on curved space. Curved space time, you look at the vacuum state Unruh effect. There's a Bockel Yubov transformation, you take that as your deformation map, so it fits in. Stuff like uh, making metric X dependent covariant derivatives is already included. And I hope it's reasonably straightforward to apply and maybe test. It's a long list, sorry. It's, it's just a proposal, so we should discuss it. Uh, there's local Lorentz invariance and local point invariance, which I believe can be implemented. Um, spin coupling is automatic. Uh, other fundamental forces fit into the framework, but they depend on internal properties. And so far, the gravitational background is taken as a classical field. It needs a full quantum formulation. I stop here. Thank you for listening.